Well, I never expected to be uh, back here quite so quite so soon as I am, Patrick. Um, mm. Such was the popularity of your interview. We invited um, questions from the floor, and we've been inundated. So, um, picked a few, and you've graciously agreed to answer them. So, I think we'd better crack straight on. Okay, I'll have a go. Okay. Uh, Firstly, a Stephen Adamson says, do you have a favourite story from all your betting experiences? Um, I suppose it has to be the one in the William Hill box. You know, it's, it's something to, uh, it's nice to take money off a bookmaker, but you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a bit of a one-off experience to be actually, you know, sat in their, almost their premises whilst doing so. Um, so this is the York Dante meeting. It wasn't that long after I made my comeback from the, from the crime problem. <clears throat> and, um, my friend Martin had an invite for two to go to the William Hill box at the York Dante meeting. And that day, um, we'd had singles, doubles and trebles. Singles, doubles and a treble on three horses in particular. Um, and but it'd be a big decent meeting. And back then, when you could get on, we'd done pretty well. So on arrival, my face wasn't really well known at the time. And um, so, you know, uh, I don't think John Brown, who was, I think, the chief executive, really, I don't think he twigged on seeing my face. But when Martin introduced me and said my name, he did a great big double take and sort of, you know, we're letting the fox into the hen house here. Um, but um, yeah, proceeded, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, we always remember the stories where we win, of course. Um, but first one won, second one won. And, uh, and Martin was outside talking to John and he said, oh, we're very worried about, you know, it turns out we've got doubles and trebles going around the country on these two horses, going to two more later on. They've already come to plenty. And um, oh, I sort of, back then, the winds of you know, size sort of really mattered to me. So uh, um, no, they still do, but they, they mattered more. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I'd found a little corner. I was busy working things out and Martin came. We didn't say a lot, but he came and sort of just walked towards me, a little smile on his face and just, he knew I wouldn't really be a drinker during the races normally, but he just picked up a bottle of champagne that was nearby and just looked me in the eye and shoved it in my direction. The, f the third leg didn't win, um, but we, there were big odds on the first one. So we, we still did nicely out of that. Excellent. Okay, um, Shane, no yeah. second name. Um, are certain personality types more likely to do well at betting than others? I'll carry on. Can creative, artistic people win at betting as well as the machine like maths cruncher? Artist types may be good at pattern recognition in betting markets. What are your thoughts? Well, no offence taken at the uh, corner of the, what was it, a machine, something maths machine cruncher. like maths cruncher. Oh, yeah, that's a very harsh, very harsh. <laughs> um, yes, there is an answer to that. The... Um, the creative artistic type should become race readers. If that's, that's your calling and if you want to be successful on the horses, because that's something that can't be crunched. You know, you think about the huge amounts of money and uh, hours and time that's been put into self-driving cars. Well, those things are, you know, not nearly as subtle as the tiny movements in a horse race that can make the difference between something being positive or negative. And so they'll never be the resources to solve that, I wouldn't have thought, by sort of computer method. It might be one day, but, but in terms of in terms of what an artistic person do, that's there to appreciate these minor subjective details. Is the horse liking the ground? Is it liking the distance? Is it liking the going, uh, the, the, going the, the track? Um, is, it, um, is the horse in a positive mental state? Um, what, what's in the mind of the horse and the other horses? What's in the mind of the jockey and the other jockeys? There's so much to interpret there. You know, is there something in hand that's hidden? Is, is the horse just idling? Um, you know, there's so much to interpret there. It's very subjective, and that's something that you, you know. Whilst the analytical, analytical people will try to break down a horse race into precisely defined parts, that's only a bit of a fudge, I would think. Even even with the most sophisticated teams. Um, so yeah, that's definitely where you'd want to go for an artistic type. Okay, this next one, not including the twenty odd calls I had, everyone <laughs> wants to know who is Branson. In the ah. previous interview. Well, we shouldn't say who is Branson because I want to clarify that. And there may have been, a, you know, it's, it's in, in putting the babbling away quite quickly. I, I may not have explained it in a way that everybody took in straight away. Um, I'm not saying the person concerned is like Richard Branson, who I made it clear I disapproved of. And I made really quite complimentary comments about the, the hidden person I alluded to. And I, and I stand by that. Um, the point is, it, the similarity is only that some people have this tremendous Branson factor where they are viewed extremely positively in terms of the image they create. A small percentage of the population, maybe two, three percent, have that ability to just be viewed incredibly positively. So I, I saw lots of guests on this and I had said it was to do with selecting of horses. So we're talking the selection advisory type thing. So as I say, the, the guesses to do with bookmakers and professional punters were, were nowhere near. Um, 
it was someone, as I say, a, an excellent chap all round, but in the very early part of his career, there was a reference to operating uh, you know, with advisory services under all sorts of different guises, which surely isn't the fairest. Um, but that was one incident in what's by all accounts has been an absolutely excellent life um, and you know, probably a much better person than myself and most of us. Um, but the point was that the reason why I mentioned that person was not that person was like Richard Branson, in terms of what my opinion is, I have a low opinion of that person, but that even within your betting per, per people interviews, you had an example of where if somebody's got that characteristic, if there was one time in the life where they erred, that they would get a pass, that it wouldn't attract any comment. I think the, say, the point I was making is that the same thing said by the vast majority of your interviewees would have attracted a different comment and say, you know, that, that's, that's one tiny part of someone's life. But I think that's a, it's, it's an interesting, throws an interesting light on the fact that when you're assessing people, um, you do need to be careful that a very positive public image, a very public image, can, um, or very, not in, even in private, the way somebody projects themselves extremely well, that can be something that can be uh, deceptive. I don't think it's, that's a person concerned you want to be, uh, to be careful of, definitely, but elsewhere you will find people who have that Branson factor um, who, who you need to be very careful because they, like, in my view, Mr. Branson himself, might be able to choose to exploit that. Okay, and the next two we've combined, they're from George McDonough and Kevin Dean. So I've combined the questions. Do you believe that betting each way to regular terms is better than those boosted, giving extra places but lower odds? And combining the question, backing each way in a 16 to 20 run a competitive handicap, which terms would you back at, assuming the same price? A quarter, one, two, three, or a fifth, one, two, three, four, five? Yeah, a quarter, one, two, three, four, maybe, or a fifth, five. Uh, you'd have a fifth, five over a quarter, four. Um, so to take an example, let's imagine a 24 runner race and all the horses are 20 to one. So there's a, there's a margin for the bookmaker on the win side. And you've got a choice of a quarter four or a fifth five. Well, if you imagine you had a, a pound each way on all the horses, under the quarter four, you'd back four winners and you'd get five to one because it's a quarter of 20 to one. Under the fifth five, you'd back five winners because five of your horses would be placed and you'd get four to one. So four winners at five to one, five winners at four to one, it sounds the same, but it's not because you get your stakes back. So on the place side, the fifth five would return you 25 pounds. You'd actually make it, even though you backed all the horses in an over round book, you'd actually make a profit on the place. Whereas in the quarter situation, you'd only back four winners at five to one, you'd only get 24 pounds back. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a sort of 4% difference or thereabouts. If you take a shorter price, imagine there was an eight to one shot in that race. Uh, under the quarter, you'd get paid out at two to one. Uh, and under the fifth, you get paid out at 1.6 to 1. So the quarter of the odds would pay 25% more. But that's in terms of the profit. In terms of the return, the quarter of the odds would return £3, and the fifth of the odds would return £2.60. And then the difference goes down to about 15%. Um, but under the five places, although, although the, the quarter places is paying you about 15% more total return on that 8 to 1 shot, the five places means that you're nearly 25% more likely to collect. It's not quite 25% because if a horse is at the front of the market in a, in a big handicap, it's more likely to win than be fifth. But in either direction, either with the 8-1 to shot or the 20-1 to shot, overall you are better with the fifth five. OK, Kane W. At what point in the day do you start to really trust a price move to know something you don't? Um, it's not something that there's a particular point. It's gradual. During the day, you'd, you'd, you'd choose to gradually trust more as the market got more mature, but there wouldn't be a, a particular tipping point, the gradual. OK, now Colin Horde. Uh, Patrick talks a lot, of, a lot about working efficiently, but how should recreational punters work efficiently to improve their betting? Um, I think analyse your process. I think, uh, you know, take a step back and be willing to not be always on the mouse wheel and think about how could I do this quicker? Is there a way I could get a shortcut? Am I repeatedly doing the same thing in a way that I could find faster or find somebody else to do it for me or find a service that cheaper provides that? Um, and just be, be taking a step back and having a think about it. Um, I know somebody who's not in horse racing and not a particularly big business that he runs, but he actually appointed a chairman um, for his business where he, he actually met the person once a month and had a meeting with his, with his chairman. Paid him a small, he was, he was a retired, very successful businessman who was just looking for some things to do happy for a small retainer and, and he met him one and felt that was very valuable that he had somebody to report to and as a sounding block and I'm not suggesting you do that 
but to some extent, almost imagine being your own chairman, that every so often, every couple of weeks, every month, reflect on the situation and are the ways you can improve it. One little thing I'd add in to some of the sort of things about keeping your brain bright, um, don't be frightened to just go and completely shut down. Even have a snooze for 10 minutes. You're going to be falling asleep for an hour and that's affecting your sleep patterns, but it doesn't do any harm to have a, if, you, if your brain is really, tar, really tired at the end of a long session of study or whatever, four or five hours, it doesn't harm to try and completely switch off. Set the alarm for 10 minutes time and just almost doze off or just rest. But you've got to, as I say, occasionally stop, occasionally rest and, uh, and step back and reflect. Okay, now Tom Weeks, do you play on the show on course exchange, etc., when high liquidity but with the risk of taking a worse price? Or do you show your hand early in the morning and take what you can at the right price? I'd be more for waiting. Um, I, I think the bookmakers are far more likely to lay you later in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, the grabbing the price has got more and more difficult. Um, and, uh, yeah, generally speaking, it, it does involve you thinking about how you're going to form your selections. If you're going with the crowd and everything, then, but, you know, if it, the, a lot of people have their strategies based on that. And it may be better to have a, a reflect on, you know, there, there are people who think, oh, we can't possibly beat the afternoon markets. But that's perhaps because they've been thinking in certain ways and thinking now in the same ways as everybody else. Whereas if you're more thinking, what type of horse tends to get overbacked? Where's the value? Where's the value against that one that, yeah, I might be seeing some of those horses that go in from, you know, four to one to seven to four, and how I sort of might have been able to predict those and thinking that's a, but what about those occasions when there's a horse that's an obvious shortener, but you've got some doubts? Is that maybe making the market for something else? You know, later in the day, you know, when the markets have reshifted, it might be a different horse that's overpriced than the one you would have backed if you were a 9 a.m. player. Okay. Now, Gambling Man Dave, he'd like to know, if you were to meet yourself at 15, what would your advice be? And what, do you have, what would you have done differently and why and where to start if you were a novice? If I went back to 15, had advice at 15, the advice, yeah, the advice I'd give myself is to do something back then completely different because there's one or two industries I've thought about over time that just have not been well handled by analytical people. The two best examples I've you know, said before about this are weather and satellite navigation. They're both catching up now, but the algorithms that have run those down the years have been hopeless. I mean, satellite navigation for decades barely got into the business of peak traffic, uh, the business of roadworks, the business of you know, how one A road is not the same as another A road, just, you know, sort of dinosaur things that was lasting for decades. And, you know, it's only recently in the very last few years that they've really started to improve on that. Um, and, and weather, you know, an industry that has, seems to have no performance standards whatsoever. Everybody just sings about the days they were right. Uh, apps talk about their convenience and this, that and the other, but no figures to prove they're better. And without even studying weather as a, from a meteorological perspective, just as an analyst saying, well, this model says this, this model says this, but looking at in which circumstances is, is which forecast correct and how do you mix the, <coughs> the different models to come up with the best possible answer along with the information from long-term averages and that sort of thing. That's something if I, both of those subjects are things that if I think if I put in half the time I put into studying horse racing, I think there would have been, you know, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not regretting not into it because I've had a wonderful time in horse racing. There's been some amazing experiences and it's a fascinating business of fascinating people. But just in terms of, you know, sort of, if you just wanted to be successful, perhaps for less work, uh, that would be going now. I think those opportunities have closed down. And funnily enough, going back to what I said about the artistic thing, there's aspects of horse racing that the, that the crunchers, hopefully I'm not just a cruncher, and I, can, I you know, do spend a lot of time reading races, um, and hopefully there that, that, that horse racing is quite suitable now. Um, so talking about a novice now, I think the biggest thing is don't run before you can walk. You need to take it steady. Ideally, you want to be starting not as a professional, starting as somebody who, um, you know, you, you, you've got a regular income coming in, you're doing it as a hobby, and you're learning the trade. And you're just taking it gradually. You're not bothered about how many bets you have or trying to win. Wouldn't be over bothered by keeping my stats of exactly whether one month one was better. But sure, write them all down and make sure you've got your betting under control. But I'd be betting for very small sums and just thinking this is an apprenticeship of learning, learning, learning.